to welcome you here this morning um, to take a, an early look at the new exhibit that we created, we created uh, commemorating the efforts of Iowans during World War II in the Pacific Theater over land and sea, Iowans in the Pacific during World War II. Every day here at the Museum District, we strive to tell the stories of veterans and the sacrifices they made as well as the sacrifices of those on the home front that gave so much why the soldiers were away. We do that on a daily basis in our Sul Sullivan Brothers Iowa Veterans Museum. Everyone is able to come in and see stories of conflict from the Civil War to today. Every now and then we actually have an opportunity to do something special in our temporary exhibit spaces like we have today that you'll be visiting here in a little bit. The funny thing about that is everybody always just says the exhibit department puts those together. That couldn't be farther from the truth. We have, in my opinion, the best team possible in the entire state of Iowa, if not the Midwest, that works in this building and all of our other buildings as well. I can't think of a department off the top of my head that isn't affected in some way when an exhibit goes together from um, Billy, first of all, because she's the one that lets me do my job, which is great, because not a lot of people will do that, but everybody from, from Bob Niemeyer, in, in research and our historians to Samantha McCombs in IT, to our graphic design department, to Nick and Katriva back in collections and archives. Everyone is affected by this. Most of all, the exhibit department, because it is an exhibit, and I'm lucky enough to have two of the best people in the world work for me, work with me, not really for me. Sometimes I think I work for them. I have William Bisbee, who is our exhibit curator, He's the gentleman that you'll see um, when you go around the corner, there's a replica of a Higgins boat. William actually constructed that from scratch all by himself based off actual Higgins plans, which is a pretty amazing feat to do in about, he built that boat in about eight days, which is amazing. Um, we, we tend to do things like that. And then the nice thing about where we work is everyone, I'm free to bounce ideas off of anybody, whether it's Billy or Carson or anyone because I want program to be involved with this as well because the kids that go through there and the adult groups as well, it's really important for they get the message that we're trying to send. So I'm not gonna talk any longer. I'm gonna introduce Jenny Bowser. She's actually our exhibit coordinator and Jenny did most of the heavy lifting on this exhibit. I'm just the guy that gets to come up and introduce her and get some of the credit. So this is Jenny Bowser. Thanks Al, as he said, my name is Jenny Bowser and I am the exhibit coordinator here at the Grout Museum. Um, Al thanked, you know, the folks who work with us here every day, but I wanted to throw a shout out to the UNI interns that helped us with this exhibit. Um, Tyler Folks, Sadie Hynek, and Caleb Schrock put in so many hours into making sure that the items in our collection were picked out and shown to us so we knew what to display to you guys. Um, and I also want to give a big thank you to Dwight Clark. He has an immense number. <laughs> of items uh, in his private collection that are Pacific and European theater items in. I think I could have spent a week at his house just going through things, <laughs> but... Um, it's 50 year accumulation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you again for loaning us your items, um, and you'll see those out there throughout the exhibit. Um, when Al told me that I was going to speak, I uh, wasn't really sure where I'd start, so I'm going to tell you a little story about me. Um, when I was a kid, I hated history class. I thought it was so boring. All it was was dates and memorization of events. Um, but when I got to eighth grade, I had a teacher who presented it in a way that made it seem interesting. He didn't focus so much on the dates and events, while those are important, but he brought up the people who lived it. He explained history is so much more um, than the dates. It's the people who lived it who made it happen. And out in our exhibit, what you're going to notice is we have um, quite a few Iowans featured, um, their stories. 
we actually have 49 um, Grout Museum District collections pieces out there that feature 19 different um, veterans from Iowa. And while you're going to see dates and events, you're also going to see the people who made those events happen. And we tried to present that in a way that brings us back to our community and lets you know what the people here did for us. Uh, on behalf of Black Hawk County Veterans Affairs, my name is Yolanda Loveless, and I really do want to take one more opportunity to thank Billy and her staff for uh, what she's doing here in the Grout Museum. They're doing some wonderful things, and to bring in remembrance to the ultimate sacrifice that some of our veterans here in Iowa have made. Um, today is the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, in the remembrance of Pearl Harbor, and so it's with great distinction and honor that I'm allowed to be back in uniform after three decades of service. Serving in Pearl Harbor on a cruiser, serving in the Philippines, uh, when you talk about the, the Bataan Death March, and the history that is associated with those. Um, nine ships that I've served on in my three decades of service. But today's theme kind of go hand in hand with what we're doing today. Uh, the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day, the theme was valor, sacrifice, and peace. Valor, sacrifice, and peace. And we're here today on the backs of a lot of great men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice and never returned home. I wanted to share two minutes before I get an opportunity to introduce my best friend, um, she has been a very supportive member of the Black Hawk County Commission. Um, she's the reason why I'm still here today. I've been trying to quit the job since I got in. Um, it's been a tough job, uh, big shoes to fill. Um, but sometimes you need that partner. And I want to kind of go over that. But I wanted to share one thing that might be already there. In my distinct honor of being the Black Hawk County Veterans uh, Affairs Director, I meet a lot of distinct veterans, right? Uh, veterans who have won or awarded the Silver Star, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and also there's opportunities where the community can donate things to our facility. One that is unique that came in, and uh, I cherish this one, is it's a World War II honoree. And this member, this World War II honoree was from Waterloo. And his name was Christopher Thomas Jr. He was killed in the Solemns, uh, Solemns area uh, he actually uh, went down with the USS Hornet in 1942. The actual date is October the 26th of 1942. And the one thing that the Navy says, the ocean never gives up its dead. Uh, and so the, the members that went down on, on the Hornet, he's one. Uh, he is memorialized in the Philippines, um, and that's where his marker is. But to know we have such great history of veterans here in Iowa, within Black Hawk County and the Cedar Valley, that have done the ultimate to allow us to be here today, to smile and enjoy and to reflect. It's just something that was, uh, I wanted to share with you guys. So my distinct honor is to introduce Colonel Warrington. Uh, Colonel Warrington joined the United States Army Reserve as a direct commission second lieutenant assigned to the 73rd Combat Support Hospital in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Five years later, she entered active duty when she completed a combined 34 years with missions in 41 countries and five wars. Then Lieutenant Colonel Warrington served as a ranking mental health officer in charge of the first CSH assigned to Operation Iraqi Freedom, field testing the new deployable medical hospital with chemical biological Design protective shielding. That's a lot to say in one word. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Warrington served two tours in the Pacific and was instrumental in developing an emergency response plans for infectious diseases, outbreaks, and pandemics with the World Health Organization. For over 37 countries, medical and nursing leaders, which have been used worldwide. Colonel Warrington was awarded the Legion of Merit for international work in public health, mental health, women and children health, and violence prevention. This native Waterloo veteran currently serves as the chair 
of the Black Hawk County Veterans Administration Commission. In addition to her work as a court-appointed special advocate, is that CASA? CASA. CASA. Uh, I, I, I graduated from East High, uh, so <laughs> forgive me. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> For the children in need of assistance. And she's a deacon at the Westminster Presbyterian Church and is a leader in the local Daughters of the American Revolution chapter. It is my distinct honor uh, to introduce Colonel Warrington. I make no apologies for being close to the ground I serve on as a U.S. officer in the <laughs> Army. <laughs> Yolando, thank you. It's my pleasure today to be part of this. Not only am I a native Waterloo from West High, and I serve beside my East High colleague, who's a native Waterloo son as well, but we represent what happened in a large part on that day of infamy, which was when Pearl Harbor got attacked, it affected more than just the Navy. It impacted all of our services. And we'd like to say at the Black Hawk County Veterans Affairs that we represent all branches, all compos, all veterans. Doesn't matter their race, their creed, their gender, when they serve, from one of the more senior officers enlisted to those who are just now serving and coming in, and in fact, our ROTC cadets that are part of our future corps. My time in the Pacific, I actually was on a Navy destroyer in the Pacific taking um, help promotion to the deck plates. And I had the distinct pleasure of finding out as a captain in the U.S. Army, when the captain of the Navy ship wasn't there, I was actually the ranking officer in the mess section. I'm like, wow, this is a really big deal, because I thought all the Navy lieutenants at first were general officers because of the stars on their sleeves. <laughs> so learning the joint world was, was fascinating. But why really am I here today? It's to introduce one of your guest speakers. And it's my distinction to introduce somebody who's extremely close to me, my father, Major General Evan Holtman. He graduated from East High at 17, and he joined the military. As soon as Pearl Harbor happened, everybody was flooding the lines to join, whether you were old enough or not. He wasn't quite old enough, so he joined under the deferment so he had to graduate from high school first before then entering the Army. But his dream was to be a pilot. And fate changed a little bit several times in his career. But he started out an E-1 and many, many decades later retired as a Major General. He's one of the few people who was called a maverick because he served quite a bit of time as enlisted before then being a commissioned officer. And I would, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce him. Dad? Thank you. <laughs> Only uh, your youngest daughter could be so gracious. <laughs> <laughs> but she's my Bull Colonel World Hero. And so th thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Colonel. A day which will live in infamy. On that Sunday morning, I remember it like it was two days ago, Sunday morning. We were at church, the family had Grace Methodist Church, which no longer exists, but some of you will recall, uh, the church that existed on the head of the east side, uh, East 4th Street. And from there we did what usually, again, on Sunday, we went to, out uh, on the hill uh, across uh, the lake uh, with the Hook family including uh, my fiance, who later became uh, my wife and uh, the mother of this uh, colonel, um, <laughs> Betty Hook. And uh, it was a log cabin in which we were seated. And what we were doing, we're ready for like this meal, for Sunday's uh, meal. And uh, 
always on a Sunday there was a program of music which we loved and enjoyed with the little radio that uh, was on the mantle and uh, all of a sudden the music stopped and a voice came on and said our country has been bombed at Pearl Harbor and the five of us my future father-in-law and uh, mother-in-law and brother-in-law and my wife later to be 73 years we looked at each other and we queried where is Pearl Harbor and I'm sure there's some of you who went through that same experience on that day because today a bombing of any kind of that nature would be known and recognized geographically by everybody but in that day and age, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, other than to Navy personnel who had served there or were serving there, was a complete stranger. And the reaction of that event, tragic event, with about 3,000 American lives, a little bit the same size as D-Day uh, later in Europe, the reaction beyond, way beyond, not knowing what or where Pearl Harbor was, but the reaction was, we are going to be and go to war. And that we did. And we brought the world to a degree, wonderful degree, which we enjoy today of freedom. And so, thank you for dedicating on this day, this great, great Memorial Day, on that day in infancy. Because the reaction, like the five Sullivans, that you uh, enjoy and make it possible for all of us to re-enjoy that family, dedicated themselves to all that freedom means to the United States of America. So, God bless you, and God bless America. In, in the first place, I feel out of place being here because when I finished basic training and was ready to go to war, the boat turned the wrong direction for me. It took me to Europe instead. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the guy from Europe doing here? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a strange the world is a strange thing. And if I, when I was growing up, uh, knew what would happen, uh, I would have said, no, 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 <laughs> as maybe many of you have. Uh, we, we also uh, have the, the problem is that things I'm going to talk about maybe happened 80 years ago. Well, some of you can't remember five years ago. How about eight years ago? It was really wild. So it's, it's really so I I feel kind of a little out of place. But but I'm so glad that the ground is doing this museum uh, uh, exhibit because the two wars that really were one in Europe and one in the Pacific were really two different wars. And it's very often that the war in Europe, I think, kind of overpowers the, the war in the Pacific. Uh, the war in Europe, when I went against an enemy, I had 47 tanks and an infantry, infantry division in front of me facing the enemy. Everyone in the Pacific first faced the, the sea, the sea. And uh, as we know from the, this being five Sullivan, the sea took its, took its course. Uh, and then when, you, we, when the people who were fighting that 
came, they didn't have 47 tanks in front of them. They had a small island that was loaded with our enemy. And they just didn't, probably they had to have said to them some Marines, but not, not that we had. So I think it's about time that we have an exhibit that, that brings honor and, and mentions more and more the fact that the war in the Pacific was a tough, tough war. And there's so many things that happened there that, that, ha that didn't happen in Europe. And so, Billy, thank you, thank you for, for putting this together. And I look forward to seeing it. And hopefully, everybody that sees it will realize the, the problems and the valor that the, that the soldiers had and the sailors had down in the Pacific. So to all of you, God bless you and enjoy the exhibit. Sunday, December the 7th in Hawaii was Saturday, December the 6th in Iowa. I had jumped on my bicycle with my rifle on my back to go 21 miles to the Boy Scout camp in Gowanus. I love to go out there and take that rifle and try to shoot at squirrels. If you ever tried to do that, you'll understand that squirrels know there's, there's another side to every branch in the tree <laughs> to hide behind. I was riding my bicycle 21 miles to go to the Boy Scout camp in Gowanus. I didn't know about Pearl Harbor until after I got home. The Japanese were trying to expand their footprint in the West Pacific, but didn't realize what they were about to do was to awake a sleeping giant, the USA. Their attack did nothing but awake the world to what they were attempting to do. As we all remember, as it started World War II, which was ended by dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. August the 1st and 3rd, we promised the Japanese that there would be more bombs dropped unless we could get ourselves to the peace table. This declaration was recognized and I landed in Japan on September the 27th, 22nd, right on time as originally scheduled to do now not a battle against the Japanese but to do occupation duty. Right. Our sea banks, the Marine Corps was great about um, keeping your sea bag on the same ship as you were. So when we got to Japan and we were not going to do battle, our, we found our, each person found their own sea bag and dug down at the bottom and took out tan pants, tan shirt, tan fore and aft cap. And we went in as visitors to Japan not people that were going to be fighting the Japanese people. It's just one of those crazy things which uh, sticks in your mind. We went into Sasebo, Japan, which if anybody's ever been in the Japanese territory, you'd understand where that is, way down on the south tip. 
So we went in our tin pants and shirts, and it, we just acted like we were going on a vacation, which in a sense it was because we weren't having to do a battle, but we were just doing occupation of, of the country. It's sort of a strange thing, and the overall picture was in the years after that, after I got married and so forth, we entertained a lot of Japanese visitors. They would come to town with about 12 of them in a group with a, an adult leader, and they would put them out into the different people's homes. So we became a very close to a lot of Japanese people, which caused us in later years to make several trips back to Japan, living in the Japanese homes and becoming closer uh, friends after fighting such a fierce war. I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> we, I have a shirt that says I'm a, a survivor. And basically anybody that's been in any battle anywhere and you have survived the battle, you are a survivor. And you thank God every day for all of those who lost their lives trying to make it safe for you. And that's one of the things about Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was just a little eight square mile piece of island in the middle of the Pacific. But the B-29 bombers that were bombing Japan had to fly over Iwo Jima. And because of that, we had to take that island away from them because they had airplanes that were going up and shooting down these B-29ers. So it became a very interesting fact in the long haul where the Marines, one branch of service, were fighting to take an island to save the lives of those from another branch of the service, both serving the same war. So the battle wasn't always fighting the Japanese and killing Japanese, but it was truly saving the lives of others that were doing the same battle as you were. I've been honored time and again wearing my hat to take a flight on an airplane someplace in the United States or the world and having somebody shout out at me, you saved my life. And there were lots and lots of people that recognized that very fact that one service could be saving the life of people of another service serving the same purpose for the world. Thank you for listening. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Raker. I am a volunteer. Uh, uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on here at the Grout uh, from the planetarium remodel, which is just outstanding, to now the new exhibit. Uh, this place is constantly changing, and that's a good thing, uh, but we couldn't do it without the support of our donors and, and people like you guys. So uh, thank you, our veterans who uh, are here today. Thank you for your service, but thank you all for, uh, for being here and supporting the Grout as well. Uh, I am part of the Opening New Doors campaign, or committee, excuse me, 
Uh, and what we're attempting to accomplish is to uh, get some really needed improvements to the building. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to relocate the, the main entrance from down below to up top where the parking lot is. Uh, and that'll make it much easier for uh, new people visiting the, the grout to obviously know where to park and then walk into the building. Uh, and it'll also showcase our, our new planetarium. Uh, by going in this, this door up here, uh, the first thing that they're going to see is our planetarium. Uh, the, and thank you uh, to the Corson family for, uh, for making that happen. Uh, and, um, excuse me, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the uh, event center down below is gonna be significantly changed uh, to accommodate you know, more events uh, and be more like in the wedding and, and uh, graduation type events. Uh, and it'll have its own separate door as it's there now. Uh, this will just allow better traffic and flow for anybody coming into the event center versus the up top for the, the Grout Museum. Uh, I'm very passionate about history and, and astronomy, and that's why I'm here. Uh, I support this, this, this committee and what this committee is up to and, and this campaign, and uh, we ask that, that you do the same uh, and, and tell your friends and neighbors to support us as well, and thank you very much. Oh, okay. I was to I How's it going everybody? My name is Steph Phillips, owner and founder of Muddy Pirate Coffee Traders. We're a local coffee roaster here in the Cedar Valley, offering coffee around the Caribbean. Uh, very good, very original. Uh, we've also got uh, gourmet pastries such as our shipwreck cookies and our rum cakes. We're based out of the Cedar Valley area. We're in the high on Ainsboro. We cater and we do events around the Cedar Valley. Contact us. I got a 24 hour They thought that was the picture that was going to be, you know, seen by everybody. Oh, man. Hold the map, the whole thing.